the most predictive measure for growth far and away is retention. And I think the reason that we paid attention to it is as a software company, the way that we are measured, the way that we are judged is not by how many customers we can get in, but is by how many of those we actually keep. Welcome back to Bite Sized. I am very excited today. I have Connor Begley, who is currently Chief Strategy Officer at Creator IQ. Creator IQ is a, a platform used by companies like Disney, Red Bull, Sephora, Unilever. I could rattle off many more providing influencer creator services. So, Connor, welcome to the podcast. I'm very excited to be chatting with you today. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. And um, it's, uh, it's going to be fun. I'm excited for it. Likewise, likewise. So, we were just connecting uh, before we started recording and you've got a really interesting and, and successful uh, career story that led you to what you're doing now. So why don't you, for anyone who doesn't know you, just give a quick five minute career story where you started um, and what you're currently doing now as Chief Strategy Officer at Creator IQ. I um, graduated during the Great Recession, 2009, which is not a great time to graduate. Um, went to a startup company called reputation.com. Uh, there was about 30, I was about the 31st employee we got up and close to 300 over the next couple of years, so hired a lot. And I ended up leading and training the sales team there when I was like 23 years old, um, which was great. And then from there, went to Australia, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, and traveled for you know three or four months, so Bali, Thailand, New Zealand, et cetera. Ended up working for this, doing some consulting for this really cool up and coming brewery. And one of the things that I realized, because uh, I was writing all the digital, I was like, you know, all these bars, you know, they have like fans and they're creating content. And that's like a very big change from the way that things used to be, right? Because this is like 2011. So this is before Instagrams, before you know, a lot of things. And so I talked to my co-founder who ended up being my co-founder, John, who was the lead software architect at a company called Marin Software. They did like large scale search bid management, like Google search bid management. And I was like, yeah, this is really weird. And he was having a similar kind of feeling on his end. And so, yeah. So then we came back, started the company. We raised $100,000 to get us out of the gates because we didn't have like a lot of credibility. Like I was the number one sales guy. He was like, you know, really good engineer, but we weren't, you know, we didn't go to Stanford. We didn't have the credibility to go out and raise or or the capability to go out and raise a million dollars or, you know, whatever. We got about a year in, we were making about a thousand dollars a month and then realized that uh, we weren't going to make it basically, right? We're running out of cash. And so then we went to all of our customers that were paying us about, you know, 50 bucks a month, like, hey, what will you pay us to do? We ended up doing some like, you know, basically like e-commerce consulting where we'd like replatform them to Shopify. We like put them on Clavio. This was back when it was just Clavio was two guys, just Ed and um, what's his name? And uh, yeah, and then we kind of figured out how to make money um, doing that. And at the same time, we also kind of figured out what really worked on the influencer side of things. And so there was this brand called Nix Cosmetics that we would track all this data on influencers. We're like, hey, let's figure out which brands these people are talking about. And the brand that stood out was Nix. Uh, well, Nix goes on to get acquired for a half billion dollars by L'Oreal, this record setting revenue multiple at the time. Um, and we got a lot of attention and then saw the same patterns like over and over again. Um, so there's a company called Too Faced, got acquired for a billion and a half by Estee Lauder. And there was a company called uh, Anastasia Beverly Hills that got valued between two to $3 billion. Then you started seeing an apparel with like Aloe Yoga, who's now north of a billion in revenue. Jim Sharks valued over a billion. Fashion Nova, right, is somewhere in the $3, 4000000000 billion revenue range, supposedly. You started seeing these same patterns, right? Yeah. And so what we tried to do is say, okay, clearly the way that these folks are approaching influencers is very different than the way that the rest of the market is approaching it. But inevitably, you know, other people will approach it the same way. And so really tried to build our approach and our software around what they were doing. And then knowing that inevitably everybody else would want to do it too. And so, yeah, so that's kind of the story. You mentioned they were doing it differently. How were they doing it differently? Yeah. So there's a few core things that they did differently. So um, one, it was always an in-house process, right? So more than half of them would work with an agency but they owned the relationships in-house, right? So they would build relationships direct between the brand and the creator, because that's what the creator or influencer wants. Um, second, they would work at scale, right? So they wouldn't work with like one or two, they'd work with hundreds, often thousands, sometimes 
the case of something like Amazon, it's like hundreds of thousands of influencers. Mm -hmm. So that was the second piece. The third piece is they start working with them really early on. Um, so they start building relationships when, you know, it's like you want to build a relationship with Kim Kardashian when she was Paris Hilton's assistant, like not today, right? <laughs> and then you kind of grow with them. And then I think the fourth part, and it's probably the most important part, is they tended to treat it a lot more like PR rather than media buying. You know, how would you get Sports Illustrated to write about Theragun, right? Well, it's like, well, if you know the editor of the magazine, that's going to help a lot, right? If you have a really, really cool event or experience that you're bringing them into, that's going to help a lot. If you have a product that's worth talking about, that's going to help a lot. If you get that product into their hands before it's released in stores, that's going to help a lot. And I think that at the time, that was very counterintuitive. And I think it is still today where most people approach influencers as a media buying exercise, right? Like yeah. what's the ROAS, how much I put in, how should I get out? And the reality is that's not actually how this stuff works. And yeah, and, I, and in terms of just proof, like there have been probably around 30 to $40 billion brands created across like beauty, fashion, food, et cetera, via influencers. And we work with 80 to 90% of them. So we've seen it again and again and again and again. Does that answer the question? It does, yeah. And it, you know, as as an agency, we we do a lot of influencer work as well. And I think to your point, it's like this: the success of influencers is down to well, how are you holding it accountable and what measurement? And I think to your point, a lot of brands, especially you know smaller DTC brands, there's a a need for there to be immediate ROI which can mm -hmm. limit the actual potential benefits of building out a, a truly effective influencer program um, to your point ar around kind of the, the way some of these other brands approached it, more kind of like brand awareness, PR, connecting with the right people. You know, so I think I, th I think that's bang on. Um, it's like that delayed gratification around the benefits that compounding influencer marketing can have on a business and the downstream effects when you think about more of the lower funnel pay media and everything else. Yeah, right? Like we've found that the more coverage you're getting from influencers, right? If you're a gym shark and everybody's talking about you all the time, right? What will happen is your ads will perform better. To your point on the like lower funnel stuff. And I think that the thing that really tends to help people conceptualize the problem is you really have to think about like as an influencer, like or what is an influencer? Like an influencer functions very similarly to a publication. You know, Vogue magazine creates a mixture of editorial content and then advertising content that it uses to pay the bills. It's if every page of Vogue magazine was an ad, it'd be like a really boring magazine. You'd never buy it. And yeah. so influencers are the same way, right? They can in front and in fact they compete very directly with yeah. the magazines, right? Vogue has an Instagram account, so does Susie the influencer. And so as an influencer, you're creating a mixture of editorial content and paid content. Um, but that ratio is about eight to one, nine to one, right? It's in that ratio, editorial versus ads. And so as a brand, the way to think about that is like, well, if 90% of the content that's created about me is editorial, how do I increase the 90%, right? And in a lot of ways, the only point of the paid content is to get more organic. So it's like, if I'm talking about Gymshark all the time, and then Gymshark comes and forms like a paid relationship with me, I go, oh, wow, I was talking about Gymshark, now I'm getting paid, I'm gonna talk about Gymshark even more, right? Yeah. And everybody else goes, oh, if I talk about Gymshark, maybe that'll happen for me too, right? And so, and frankly, from a consumer perspective, editorial coverage, like organic coverage is much more convincing than an ad. Yeah, that makes sense. You've been in the space a long time, as have I. So you've kind of seen the shifts in the influencer worlds, you've seen the shifts in how platforms, you know, the meta, the, the launch of TikTok, Snapchat. Speak to me a little bit more about the evolving trends of those platforms and how it's change the landscape of influencer and creator marketing? If you were to look at the you know, most categories where influencers have an impact, it's a small number of platforms, right? So it's generally Instagram at the top, then it's TikTok, then it's YouTube. Um, now that changes by category. So like, let's say in gaming, right? YouTube plays a much bigger role than the other channels. So there are some differences or like, for whatever reason in sports, like Facebook crushes it. I don't know if it's because it appeals to an older audience. I don't know. But like yeah. in general, most beauty, fashion, entertainment, food, Bev, that's the hierarchy. Um, now how it's changed over time, TikTok grew really rapidly, particularly through 2022 and 2023, in terms of the volume of content coming from influencers. So it more than doubled its share of the conversation over that time. 
So it went from about 60%, went from about 80, 90% Instagram to about 60%. And TikTok went to about 30, 35% in that range, right? Yeah. Again, talking about the main category. So it's excluding like sports and, and gaming. And part of the reason that that occurred, I think, was on TikTok specifically, you know, at the beginning phase, everybody's in a mad dash to like build their audience, right? Like it was a gold rush, like, hey, if you're early on TikTok, you can build a really big audience. And then over the last year and a half or so, you know, now like, okay, how do I make money off this thing? Right. And so they've started talking about brands and participating with brands because still, you know, 70% to 80% of the money that creators make is via brand deals. That's how they make their money still today. And so now there has been like, I think over the last year and a half to two years, I think that Instagram and YouTube have really caught up when it comes to short form content, right? With YouTube shorts, yeah. with Instagram reels. And so you've seen those growth rates kind of normalize between the three, right? They're all growing at around the same rate now in terms of our data. So yeah. So that's kind of what I've seen across the platforms. What I'd love to drill down to a little bit on that is, you know, the platforms are evolving. How is that changing maybe the opportunity for influencers and, and therefore how brands look to partner with influencers on these different platforms? And 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 maybe touch upon, you know, it, it's a bit of a conflicting element to what we we're just mentioning about influencers being more PR, but how is social commerce changing what you're seeing in terms of influencers, their ability to monetize their, their audiences and reach? And again, how brands are thinking about, well, there's an awareness piece, but now there's direct on-platform revenue driving commercial opportunities. Totally. It's a big part of the mix, right? And I don't, I don't mean to uh, talk it down um, in terms of focusing on earned. I think that's just something that like people tend to get wrong about these yeah. spaces. They only think about it as being a revenue driving activity. In terms of how social commerce has changed over time, I think that there have been a lot of stumbles. A lot of people have tried and a lot of people have failed and it hasn't worked, right? And for a variety of reasons. With that said, I mean, if you were to go all the way back to like, you know, check out the code in my bio, right? Like it's existed for a long time. And so I think that the platforms are continuing to like change, learn, try new things. I think the most successful version of that so far is TikTok shops, right? So yeah. there's a lot of brands that are being built on TikTok shops and making a lot of money there. TikTok's investing very heavily themselves. I think if you were to look at, like we just had the managing director of YouTube shopping on our podcast, you know, they just announced like a massive partnership with Shopify. That's really cool, right? Yeah. So they're all trying to move in that direction. I'll be curious to see how it evolves over time. I think if you were to look at like, I'm going to lump you in with my generation, like our generation, I think that like going direct from content to shopping had like a negative connotation associated with like QVC, HSN, et cetera. We're like, that's not cool, right? Like that's, I don't, I don't want to, you know, but I don't know that the younger generation has that same association, right? I don't yeah. think that they're as like turned off by something going direct from content to commerce. And so um, similar to the way that it functions in China, like since we've started this company, people are like, it's going to be like China, like, cause there's so much live shopping in China and it's just never really worked. But that could be changing, right? It could be that the younger generation doesn't have that same aversion. So I'm of your generation. So I, <laughs> I, 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 I appreciate you trying to uh, make, me, make me younger, but no, I agree. And, and you know, it's a, it's a very small snapshot, right? But I have a 14 year old daughter and, you know, obviously she is on TikTok far too much for my liking, but she <laughs> is. And, and I just wonder, you know, yes, it's on a slightly broader time horizon, but to your point, it's interesting to think of, well, this younger generation who are coming up and, uh, you know, kind of living on these platforms, again, as much as we might not like it, they are, and they're not accustomed to websites. Is there a day whereby the website becomes not obsolete? Like, don't get me wrong, because brands are always going to want to own customer data and everything else. But I can only see that trend increasing, right? When it's like these platforms are becoming very creator first. People go onto platforms to follow creators, follow these certain people. And the more that either brands are created from them or social commerce comes into play, I, I can only see that change kind of broadening. For sure. The one thing I think a lot about, though, that I do think makes creator commerce a little bit more difficult, right? Is I think there was a reason that like to know it really took off when it did. And that's because of the way that people use social networks. It's like when I'm on a social network, like particularly we'll, we'll start with Instagram, like I'm not really shopping, right? Like I'm watching, I'm being entertained, I'm reading, maybe I'm being inspired. I'm not like shopping. And yeah. like, and there very much is like a routine to shopping, which is like, hey, I really like this shirt, but I want to go see like, well, what are the different reviews on that shirt? And like, 
what are the different sizes and like what are they what if there's a lower price at another retailer right or what what if there's another shirt i don't even know about that i want that's similar right yeah and so that's why i think the like to know it works so well because like i like this i want to go check it out when i'm shopping later but i don't want to impulse purchase it right now right yeah. and so i think that that behavior is going to be very very hard to change and very very hard to replicate frankly as a social network right like yeah. it's just not something that's like super easy to do but for items where you are going to impulse purchase where you're going to see it and buy it now i think it does you know they're getting better and better at doing that going a little bit back to creator iq then and, and some of the brands you work with and you know you spoke about looking at how these billion dollar valued or sold brands kind of approached influence marketing. How is how is Creator IQ helping brands execute effective influencer campaigns? We actually, in a lot of ways, are kind of Switzerland, right? Like we don't get in the middle of any of this. I think that just for those that don't know us, we are a software tools and data platform. So we're much closer to like a Salesforce or a HubSpot, right? Where it's like I as a brand am working with, or I am as an agency working with hundreds or thousands of creators. I need to be able to keep track of like who's talking about me, how they're performing, how this campaign did versus this campaign versus that campaign. What is my share of voice in the market, right? How am I Nike doing versus Adidas versus uh, Noble versus whatever, right? Like that's something that, you know, those are kind of the tools that we're providing as well as like, Hey, how do I actually keep track of every piece of content this creator has created about me across Instagram and YouTube and Twitter and TikTok and Pinterest and blah, 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 right? So that's really the way that we exist or the value that we provide in the funnel. And in a lot of ways, I see that like our role in this ecosystem is actually to bring people together, right? So bring the social platforms together, bring the agencies and the brands together. Frankly, we have most of the creator economy companies are our customers and to help them all collaborate more effectively, right? To yeah. kind of reduce the friction there. So that's that's kind of how we help, how I think about it. With that and in your position, you obviously have a lot of data and insight into what's working, what's not, and, and you know, dependent on what the actual ultimate measurement is. So much is spoke about around creative being the variable, right? So how do you think about, or how should people be thinking about, okay, I, I want to establish an influencer program. How do I make sure that the content is of a quality or standard or elicits the right type of response or action from, from consumers? Yeah, I think one of the biggest mistakes that brands make is they're very prescriptive in this department, right? They say, here's the script, here's I want you I want you to say, here's the tagline, here's what I want you to write. And I think as a as a creator, as an influencer, like you know your audience, you know your voice, those two things rarely match up, right? And so I think that deciding like, okay, you know, I'm gonna give creative control to this person and allow them to really drive the ship in terms of where they go with this content, give them like rough guidelines. But that tends to work the best, right? And then I think the other area that I'm a really big fan of is the idea of like, okay, like we don't know what's going to work. And frankly, we're not even going to like push like a particularly strong narrative, but it's like, we're going to find the top thousand influencers that create content about our category. And then we're going to like gift them, right? We're going to be like, how do we get our product into their hands? Like, hey, we'd love to send you a free gift. Let us know if you'd like to try it. We're going to give it to you before it's in the stores. So you have an opportunity to tell your audience about it and get exclusive access. And then you get all kinds of really cool stuff. Some of it's going to suck. Some of it's going to be great. And the stuff that's great and the stuff that hits from an audience perspective, now we're going to put money behind that, right? And boost that content so that we increase the exposure. Because yeah. it's like, particularly on TikTok, I think one of the challenges there is there's not a lot of predictability in terms of what's going to perform or not perform. Yeah. And because of the way that the algorithm works there, right? Like versus Instagram, it's like, if you follow me, you're more likely to see my stuff. On TikTok, it doesn't really matter that much, right? Yeah. And so the only thing that matters is, is the content good? Is it compelling? Is it interesting? If it is, it'll do very well. So that's kind of how I how I think about it. I hear look, two schools of thoughts, and I think it's dependent on, again, coming back to the usage of send them briefs, be very detailed, be very specific, otherwise you're not going to get back a good deliverable. That's more if you're going to be repurposing that into your own channels. It's based on a, a format that you've probably seen work previously, whereas really if you're looking to partner with influencers and tap into their audience. So I think a level of trust of they know what works for that audience and keeping it a bit more authentic. I, I think to your point makes makes more sense. One of the debates or not, like one of the discussions, like you've got this word influencer and you've got this word creator and they're like, what are they, right? And like they get used in different contexts and there's not like, I mean, this is kind of B 
being defined live, I think within the industry. And the way that I think about it is similar to the way that you just described it, which is like an influencer is somebody that like has an audience. They are creating content for that audience. That's the purpose of the content. And it is going to be related to your brand. It's going to be connected to your brand, but it's not for the purpose of you using that somewhere else necessarily. Yeah. Right. Whereas like there's a bunch of small creators that are great photographers, great at video, doing cool creative stuff. And like, instead of working with a creative agency to go out and get these assets created, I'm going to work with a bunch of these micro creators. And like, to your point, very strict, direct brief. This is exactly what I'm looking for because the primary purpose is not to influence your audience, but is to use that in an ad, to use it on the website, to use it in an email, use it somewhere else. I think that's how the the lines are starting to, to form. I was going to ask you that question. So you were- <laughs> There you go. Already hit. Because the, you know, the word influencers, creators get used interchangeably all the time um, in the industry. And then you throw in affiliates and ambassadors and UGC and all this other sort of stuff. And I think it is important to kind of you know, whether you want to have your own definition against it, that's fine. I, I agree with your definition, right? An influencer has an audience you're trying to tap into. A creator is great at creating content and how you look to work with them is different. And then that's also different based on the measurement. And I think that's where brands need to get really specific. It's like a lot of people will say influencer marketing doesn't work against what measurement. Um, if you're trying to do that and you're expecting, well, I'm going to gift a bunch of product and I'm going to see a massive spike in my sales the next day they started posting. Is it not working or are you holding it against the measurement that's not reflective of the execution. And I think that's where a lot of brands struggle is especially smaller brands who are like, well, a good way to get my brand seen is to have other people post about it, but I need direct revenue right now. Yeah, that's not how it works. And that's not how consumers work, right? Like I think that, and we've done a ton of research on this, right? So we tend to work with the bigger boys. We work with Coke, Nestle, Disney, et cetera, the, like you listed. And, you know, so they get really precise about this kind of stuff, or they try to get really precise about this yeah. stuff. And the thing to think about is there's a natural time lag between buzz and sales, right? Mm -hmm. So like I've heard about the sphere in Las Vegas 47 times. I haven't at, gone and actually spent any money there. But if I go to Las Vegas, the likelihood that I will is much higher, right? Because I've seen it all the time on social. Yeah. And so the way to think about that, the way that you measure it, right? The way that these really sophisticated organizations measure it is using what's commonly referred to as marketing mix modeling, right? Which is saying like, hey, let's put all of our variables in and see what predicts sales. And what you find that becomes very predictive when it comes to influencer marketing is this concept of share voice, right? So there's a total conversation that is happening in the world for my category. So let's say, you know, the athleisure category, because we're talking about a little bit today, right? So there's a total conversation that's happening across Aloe Yoga and Gymshark and, you know, and, and, and Lululemon, et cetera. And so the question becomes, well, what percentage of that conversation do I own? How much of it do I have? Like today, Gymshark's the number three brand in the world that we track in apparel. It's insane. They're yeah. well ahead of Aloe Yoga. They're well ahead of Lulu. So they are outperforming kind of their market share, right? So relative to their market share, they've got way more buzz, right? So Lululemon's like 11th in share voice while Gymshark's way up here, even though Lululemon makes more money. And yeah. so what that indicates and what ends up happening is when you see that gap, when you see it's called excess share of voice. So when you have buzz that's in far excess of your sales, you are very likely to grow in the future, right? Because a certain percentage of those people will convert from, hey, I've been thinking about the sphere for a long time, like, hey, I'm actually going to go to the sphere. Yeah. And so it's one of the most challenging parts about this problem, similar to PR, frankly, PR, uh, PR operates very similarly, where it's like, yeah, I'm getting a lot of buzz now, but it doesn't actually instantly translate to sales. And I can't directly measure when Rihanna talks about Gucci and how much impact that has on Gucci. It's very difficult, right? But functionally, that's how you should be measuring it. I really like that breakdown. It's and probably the most, it's one of the most important things we've learned. There's one other thing that's probably top two. What's the one other thing? Go on, hit us with a third. <laughs> So the other thing, and this would probably be the biggest misconception in the category, is if you look at what predicts success. So, you know, let's look at like a brand like Celsius, right? So like Celsius crushes it, is retention. So like most people tend to focus on how do I go out and get like a new person to talk about me, right? Like I'm Celsius, I want whoever, The Rock, 
to start talking about me. And that's great. Okay, great. I got The Rock to talk about me. Whether it was a sponsorship or not a sponsorship, whatever, he's talking about me. Well, what actually predicts success is not whether or not you can get The Rock, but whether or not you can keep The Rock. And whether you can keep him year after year after year after year after year. In the same way that like, let's say I got Vogue magazine to write two articles about me this year, right? Because I'm some new up and coming luxury brand. Well, I want them to write about me next year too, right? And I don't want them to write two articles and to write four. And so if you look at it, the most predictive measure for growth far and away is retention. And I think the reason that we paid attention to it is as a software company, the way that we are measured, the way that we are judged is not by how many customers we can get in, but is by how many of those we actually keep. Right? What is our retention rate once we get them in the door? Yeah. And this is very similar to for consumer brands, like, well, what's your repeat purchase rate, right? You got a customer in, did they come back and buy again? And that will be far and away the most important number for you as a consumer product brand in terms of predicting whether or not you're going to grow long term. And so that's probably the most counterintuitive measurement that we've figured out. And I have you know, reams of data to support it. But it's that's probably the other thing. Those are the two most important things. So you're saying the retention of the actual influencers is a key metric to ultimate success of your influencer program. It's the most important measure, far and away, is once you get people in, can you keep them? Do you think that's also, is, is an aspect of that measure that when you have consistency of being able to retain the right influencers, that also elicits consistency and authenticity behind the fact that they're validating the brand on an ongoing and consistent basis? Exactly. Exactly. Right. So, you know, everybody follows a creator. Right. And you think about like I follow like Pat McAfee, like a sports talk guy. Right. And he's talked about like FanDuel for like 10 years and like FanDuel and him are associated in my mind. Yeah. In a lot of ways, because he's talked about them for so long, it's added significant credibility to the strength of that relationship. So, yeah. It's super critical in terms of both impacting perceived authenticity of that relationship, as well as, you know, the reality is for any brand, beauty, food, fashion, entertainment, whatever, there are a finite number of people in the world that will ever talk about you. There are only so many people that have a sizable audience that talk about entertainment, right? And so if you're bringing people in and then losing half of them every year, you just run out. Eventually you run out. And so you have to, if you want to get into these upper echelons, you have to not only acquire, but then retain. But you got to do both, right? So I've now acquired, I'm retaining, and I'm acquiring it, right? Like that's yeah. the funnel that you have to do on. And that's a really really important point for anyone listening who is, you know, either thinking about or is running an influencer program. Because it's something we see, you know, when we're working with influencers, it's like the one-off agreements or arrangements typically don't do much. It's the consistency of the content or the partnership. And I think a good way to approach that, and you mentioned kind of like gifting products, right? We, we want to send you products. It's a good way of testing, well, what resonates and then when you find out some influencers or creators that are resonating, like start to establish a partnership off the back of that. And, and that's an approach we take and it sounds like, and it's an approach that you kind of recommend as well. It, it may be, for, like I said, for, for earlier, earlier businesses, but also to your point, to keep expanding on the influencers you have. Keep testing different types of influencers. Because I think an, another use case, and maybe you can talk about if you've seen this as well is, you know, if you've got a core demographic of people in the category talking about your brand, a way of expanding into potentially new consumers who haven't heard of you is, well, how can we test something else? And I kind of look at, this might not be the best example, but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, like <laughs> Sal Salomon, the footwear brand, when they partnered yeah. with Rihanna. Running shoe, hip hop star, right? Like that's maybe not who they might have been partnering pre with previously, but it brought a whole new different consumer and audience to be aware of the brand. What's your thoughts on that? Do you have is there any, any specific kind of like takes on that? Yeah, I mean, I will. I'm in terms of that particular partnership. It sounds really cool. I think the thing I think a lot about, and this goes back to, and and let's maybe let's maybe take a step back. So there are a set of brands and categories that influencers naturally talk about. So beauty, fashion, entertainment, food and bev, travel, et cetera. Shit that people like to talk about, right? And then you have stuff that people don't talk about, like deodorant or armored cars or banking services. Like there's not, there's not that much stuff there, right? So I'm gonna put those categories to the side. We are not talking about those categories. We're talking about the categories where influencers naturally like to talk about it. So to go back to that 90-10 split, right? 90% of the content that gets created about me is 
you know, editorial in nature, right? And 10% is, is sponsored. And so how does that change the equation in terms of who you decide to sponsor and who you decide to work with? Well, it's like, let's go back to this idea of them as magazines. So like I am, we'll use a beauty brand. I'm a beauty brand, right? And I could work with, I could sponsor and partner with Glamour Magazine, which talks about beauty all the time editorially, right? They're constantly, there's a lot of opportunities for me to get editorial coverage. Or I could partner with Town and Country Magazine, which is, you know, doesn't talk about beauty, maybe a few times a year, right? Now, the reality is going to Town and Country Magazine, like will reach a new audience, right? But the problem is that the when people buy that magazine, they're not looking for beauty advice. They're probably, maybe not that into beauty, right? And it's just not, it's just not the mindset that they're in at that time, right? Yeah. And as much as we like to pretend there's some separation between editorial and advertising, it doesn't really exist, particularly in the influencer world, right? Like influencers are getting sponsored by a brand. We'll talk about that brand more often organically, right? It's just how it works. And so when you decide to partner with Glamour Magazine, one, their audience we know is into beauty. That's why they buy the magazine. Number two, there will be, you know, they're in that mindset, right? That's why they're reading that magazine is to learn more about beauty, right? That's one of the main reasons they buy it. And then third, in terms of editorial content, now the editor is like, well, this is one of my largest advertisers. Let's make sure we support them, right? Like, let's make sure we're getting them some coverage. And so I think you can take the same principle to influencers. And we saw this very early on where it's like, hey, these beauty brands be like, hey, I want to reach, I want to start working with these fashion influencers. And I was like, "Eh, I don't think you should, right? Like they don't talk about beauty. And so they reached out, they sent him a bunch of product, and it was fucking crickets. Like nobody talked to him, nothing happened, right? Yeah. And when they would do sponsored content, it wouldn't perform. And it's like, well, if that person has literally never talked about beauty before, that means that one, they're not interested in it. Two, their audience doesn't go to them for, you know, they don't trust their opinions when it comes to beauty. And three, like they're not going to talk about you editorially, right? None of those principles follow through. And so I think that it's good like to reach new audiences. But if that person has never talked about that category, is not passionate about that category or has any interest in it, you know, it's very unlikely to be successful long-term. But it's much longer than it probably needed to be. But uh, I think it's important. Going back to trends and shifts, again, you've seen, I've seen the the many different trends and shifts over the last couple of years. What future trends do you think we can expect to see in the influencer space and and how should brands be thinking about how to capitalize on that? Yeah. I mean, I think in terms of future trends, I mean, I think a lot of what we know has not changed, right? So a lot of the things that I've talked about from a principles perspective will not change. They'll continue to be a mixture of editorial and advertising. Um, relationships and long-term relationships will continue to be critical. I think all those things will stay the same. I think one of the things that is emerging and you see it more and more, like you see it with like Prime, right? Which was a brand founded by Logan Paul and um, another influencer, hit up $1.2 billion in sales in year two. Or Skims, which was founded by Kim Kardashian, hit $750 million and a $4 billion valuation. So I think you're starting to see more and more influencers get onto the cap table and or co-found brands. And, you know, all the candy brands are like, scared shitless of feastables because it's kicking their ass in market, right? Yeah. And so I think you're seeing more and more of these influencers either co-found brands or be a part of a brand in an equity capacity. Like if you know, um, like Rick Ross, do you know like the brand Luke Belair? Do you know that brand? I didn't, I don't know that brand. I know Rick Ross obviously, but no. So they're the number one brand we track in all of alcohol, right? So we track all the influencers to see what they're talking about. Number one brand. They're also the number one rosé in the United States by revenue. They're the fastest growing brand searched for any alcohol brand in the US. 90% of the content comes from Rick Ross. He talks about them on average about eight times a day. Um, it's it's insane, right? And I don't actually think that's the right strategy, but it's an illustration of what's happening there, right? So yeah. I think that's going to continue to happen just because as the influencers, they're trying to figure out, or creators, they're trying to figure out, how do I make money outside of brand deals? And particularly at a higher end level, you can you know launch your own brand. So I think that's something that's definitely going to change. I think it's interesting to watch some of the other platforms emerge. Like Snap has been very resistant to getting into the kind of creator influencer game. And yeah. they've changed. They've turned on that big time and they're investing in it really heavily. So I think that's a channel that I'd be paying attention to. I also think, and I don't think this is just a B2B thing, but it's like I'm now generating on my LinkedIn, which only has 10,000 fans, more impressions than our website, all of our social media, 
our podcast, all of our content. Every content channel we have combined is less than my LinkedIn. And it's growing at almost 150% year over year. And I'm not, I'm not that good. Like I'm okay, right? And that's in the B2B world. But if you look to the B2C world, if you look at like there's a woman named Corey Marchesoto. So she's a CMO of a brand called Elf Cosmetics, which I believe is the best performing stock on the stock market in the US over the last like four or five years. It's up like a thousand or 2000%. It's insane. They're valued, I think, eight to 10 billion, something like that. She's really avid creating on LinkedIn. And she's like a B2C brand. Yeah. And I asked her, I was like, well, why? She's like, well, she's like, there's over a billion people on LinkedIn, like over a billion users, you know? And if you think about who those users are as a consumer company, it's like your partners, your retailers, your employees, it's like an incredibly impactful audience. It's yeah. trade press, right? Like it's a very, very important group of people. It's journalists, right? So that's another channel. I think those two channels have been ones I've been talking about more. Because I think that they're think they're very under leveraged right now. So much in there that I completely agree with all of it. In fact, creator led brands, influencer led brands, you know, and I think like it's tapping into so many other trends of of consumers kind of wanting to know more about who's behind the brand, right? That that kind of visibility and transparency and the the focus on community building as well. You know, like building a community around around the brand, but so many of it not easier to establish, but when you have an audience around your personal brand as an influencer or creator, it's really meaningful. People want to hear from people, right? And I think like there's this crazy stat. Let me see if I can grab it here. So there was the um Chamath, right? Polly Apatia, who's on the All In podcast, which has got a lot of fame, put out a big report on the industry, right? And it's got a lot of attention. And the stat he highlighted that's crazy is like, let's see. So Ford versus Tesla. So Ford spends about two and a half billion dollars a year on marketing. Tesla spends about a hundred million. While Tesla is worth $540 billion and Ford is worth 50 billion. So Tesla is worth 10 times what Ford is, but Ford is spending 25 times the amount on advertising as yep. Tesla. And like, where does it come from? We all know where it comes from, right? Yeah. Elon's account is going to be a hundred times, 150 times the size of Ford's, right? And so I think that gap, it's like, what were the other ones he said? He said, let me see, I got it here somewhere. It's like Feastables between Mr. Beast and Feastables, they've got 414 million fans. Mm -hmm. Hershey's has one. Prime has 117 million. Monster has 15. Skims has 381 million. Spanx has two. Right. Like, yeah. how do you compete with that? Like, yeah. that's crazy. Right. Like yeah. you've got a media network that's 150 to 200 times the size. So it's, it's going to be a big emergent trend. You can't compete against that. If you got that and good product, you, you know, you, it's, that's very difficult to compete against. And I, I definitely agree with you. I think people start personal brands to initially get brand deals, and then there'll be more and more of the brands of the future that are led by people with audiences who know how to also grow an audience. Whereas traditional brands, you know, I, I think are, they're going to struggle with that. Um, and I definitely agree with you, LinkedIn. I'm not as consistent as I set out to be on December 31st of 2023 um, in my New Year's resolutions. But, you know, it, to your point, the way they're shifting that platform, and I mean, you'll remember this. I only ever used to go on LinkedIn if I was looking, do I need a new job? All right, I'll yeah, go on totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah, looking. You know, I think even to see such a B2B platform become very kind of creator-focused, creator-led, I'm really interested to see where that where they take that. And I love your example, because yeah, you know, it was a big reach. And yes, are people in the environment for shopping? No, but learning from and getting access to like personal brands and connecting and learning about different brands and people, it's the reach is incredible. I hope they don't start to cap it and make us all pay for it like Instagram did. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll be, I mean, it'll be like anything else. There'll be a gold rush. I think it's just, I think the gold rush is starting because there's yeah. just like, it was, in a lot of ways, I think this happened with most social networks where it's like, I remember my wife had a friend who was like a school teacher, it's like, I don't know, 10 years ago. And she started like trying to be an influencer on Instagram. And you know, everybody's like whispering, like, oh, do you see what, you know, and like, you know, everybody's talking shit. And, and so, cause it's cringe, right? It's a little bit cringy, like, oh, it's kind of yeah. cringy. And especially when you've got like, you know, a couple hundred fans, right? Like, oh God, what's this person doing? But now, you know, she's got like 150,000 followers. She does this full time, like, and she keeps yeah. growing and it's like, I think it's in that phase where it's like a little cringe and so people don't want to do it, but that's yeah. actually the opportunity. I agree with you. I'm all in, but need to be more consistent. Yeah. It's, a, it's a lot of work. 
Like not to it say is. I'm shy of work, but you know, you in your position, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of it is. I mean, you're on you're on a podcast. It, it's content. You know, I think about my job as founder CEO of a performance agency. I, I'd, I'd say I, I try and dedicate a couple of hours, you know, a day, and I should probably even do more of just creating content, writing yeah. on LinkedIn, posting here, webinar. Like, and there's so many channels, right? I know you've got to be channel specific and pick one, and LinkedIn is for me is the one. I can't. I struggle with Twitter because I think my British sarcasm overtakes every single. 140 characters <laughs> and I know you could write more but I just, I just I struggle with Twitter I'm part of a good community but I struggle I, I prefer LinkedIn Twitter just brings out my sarcastic side I don't know why yeah I um when I started I was doing LinkedIn and Twitter and it was too much the odd thing was I was producing about the same amount of coverage like same amount of impressions and such on Twitter as I was on LinkedIn so it was working the big problem is I just think the audience wasn't quite the right audience for me. And it was just like a time thing. Yeah. I just didn't have time. Like I couldn't yeah. do both well. So I think being like, pick your channel, be really good at it. And then once you start to build a sizable audience, then start thinking about other channels. Yeah. That's Great. I think the right approach. I agree. Is it? I, I tell other people that I, I reminding myself sometimes. So I appreciate that. <laughs> um, Connor, I, I, I really appreciate you coming on. I, I think so insightful stuff that you've mentioned in, in terms of the world of influencers. And I, and I agree wholeheartedly on, on so much of what you say. So really appreciate you being on the podcast. Thank you for all the information and insights. Um, is there anything you want to say to, to kind of close out the episode? I think that I'll say this in a lot of my present, like when I'm going out and speaking or whatever, like I think that this category will be the most important category of marketing for the categories that I outlined. And because of that, what's going to happen is people that enter into this career, I expect to have the fast track to being kind of the CMOs of the future of these brands, right? And so my encouragement, I'm always happy to help anybody that needs help. Just Connor at Creator IQ, single N, C-O-N-O-R. I'm happy to help. Let me know. But uh, good luck to everybody that is embarking. It's going to be, it's going to continue to be a bigger and bigger deal over time. Agrees. Love it. Thank you so much, Connor. Really appreciate you being on. Yeah, no problem. Thanks again.